Hey folks, Dennis here with Quantum Creation. Hi Dennis, I'm Marty. Quantum Creation, you say? We're gonna have fun. Well, well, I am. Where we talk about the overwhelming support science has for the existence of God. As you damn well know, Dennis, there is a very strong negative correlation between scientific literacy and religiosity. And you also know why that is. It's because there is absolutely zero scientific support for the existence of gods. Today we discuss God is light. What does that even mean? Having a wavelength of between 400 and 750 nanometers is not a defining characteristic of a god. A god, if we're going by a definition of god under which you find every god ever worshipped in any real world religion that I'm aware of anyway, then a god is a supernatural, anthropomorphic, personal being in control of at least some aspect of nature. Light does not meet that definition at all. In the Bible, there are almost 100 passages that describe God and Christ as light. Many of these are descriptions as a metaphor. Exactly. Because sight is our primary sense and light is what allows us to see, we tend to feel comfortable in the light and uncomfortable in the dark. Therefore, people associate light with good and darkness with evil. But if you're going to take this metaphorically, that God is light simply means God is good, aren't we done? I mean, not only have you already abandoned the central thesis of this video, but you've also raised the question of why you don't take the entire concept of a god as metaphor. If you acknowledge that the Bible can't be taken literally, what is your method for distinguishing the metaphors from the literal? Why not take it all as metaphor? And when we look at science, especially in the field of quantum physics... Here we go. Claim number one. God created the universe. Now, thanks to the scientists at CERN Laboratories in Geneva, Switzerland, with the Large Hadron Collider, they've been able to go back and recreate what occurred at the instance of the Big Bang. No, we can recreate the conditions a tiny fraction of a second after that instant, but not those of that instant itself. Now, at this moment, 13.8 billion years ago, there was no matter. So imagine all the stars and planets, space gas, everything of the universe condensing down and transitioning back to pure energy into a state of what's called a singularity. No, the singularity is a prediction of general relativity. And since that breaks down at the quantum scale, which is very relevant here, there's a very good chance that this prediction is incorrect and then explosion takes place. Can you get anything right? Nothing exploded. The defining characteristic of an explosion is that energy is released into the surrounding environment. The energy from the Big Bang is still inside space. So space did not explode, it just got bigger. Light, scientists have discovered, was at this instance a part of a superforce and played a part in the development of matter. No, no, just stop. You're conflating light with energy. Light can be said to be a type of energy, photons with wavelengths that our eyes have evolved to detect. But the quarks that form nuclear particles formed as a result of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic forces splitting into distinct forces. And electrons form through pair production involving photons in the gamma range, which we can't see. So light definitely didn't create all matter, and to say that it created any matter requires you to really stretch the definition of light. Einstein's e equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Energy can convert and make matter. Yes. Energy, not light specifically. Don't put too much weight on the name, speed of light. It's a poorly named constant. It's better to think of it as the speed of causality. In order for atoms such as hydrogen or carbon to hold their shape and their consistency, the electrons that orbit around in orbital shells around the nucleus are held in consistency around their orbits by light. 
No, being negatively charged, they are held in place by the electric attraction, the Coulomb attraction between themselves and the positively charged particles in the atom's nucleus. Light is one electromagnetic phenomenon. Coulomb attraction is another electromagnetic phenomenon. The fact that they are both electromagnetic phenomena does not mean that they are synonymous with each other. This is called the fallacy of the undistributed middle. I know, lots of syllables. I'll explain. Kent Hovind is a criminal. Charles Manson is also a criminal. So by your reasoning, Kent Hovind is the same person as Charles Manson. A is a C, B is a C. Therefore, A equals B. This is fallacious reasoning. Apples are not oranges just because they are both fruits. Claim two. Wait, 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 <laughs> hang on. Can we at least stick to the first claim until you have made some kind of case for it? I mean, even if I grant you incorrectly that light created matter, the claim was that light created the universe and you haven't even addressed that. Claim two. Not a single attempt. Claim two. Okay, fine, go ahead. God created life. There are a number of conditions that have to be just right for life to originate on Earth and to be sustained over time. What the hell does this have to do with light creating life? It's just a fine-tuning argument. Which, by the way, is an argument against the existence of gods. If a god existed, he could just snap his fingers and make life exist anywhere under any conditions. Because gods are above the laws of nature, aren't they? I mean, if they're not, what the hell kind of gods are they? This need for apparent fine-tuning in order for life to be able to exist only exist if gods do not. If gods exist, then nature is powerless, and the laws of nature that apparently must be finely tuned for life go right out the window. And why shouldn't they? They're so inconvenient. And atoms are held together into molecules because light holds them together. Nope, that's also electric attraction. Yet another fallacy of the undistributed middle. Claim three, God is omnipresent, everywhere at all times. Here's the W map, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe launched by NASA in 2001. It was launched out into space to measure the temperature differences in the cosmic microwave background. So now God is the cosmic microwave background? First God is light, now God is microwaves. Well, I do admit it would be pretty cool to be able to turn water into wine in my microwave oven. But look, all you're doing is finding something that apparently exists everywhere and you're calling it God because it happens to share one characteristic with your proposed God. Again, fallacy of the undistributed metal. Claim four, God is omniscient, all-knowing. Matter exists in what's called a superposition, a wave-particle duality. However, experiments involve light to help with scientists to study the transition from an invisible wave to a physical manifestation as a particle. Waves are physical manifestations. They find that unless they release the data or the knowledge of this transition taking place, for some strange reason, the transition doesn't occur. That is literally the worst attempt to explain the double slit experiment that I have ever heard, and I have heard Jordan of Spirit Science explain it. The transition you're talking about is what, in the Copenhagen interpretation, is called wave function collapse. This has nothing to do with knowledge being released. It's a result of the particle being measured, interacting with the measurement apparatus. This entanglement forces the particle into a distinct state, which we recognize as a classical particle. Without the measurement taking place, the particle is not forced into a distinct state and therefore exists in a superposition of all possible states. A wave. Claim 5. God is eternal and not bound by time. We measure time moving along at the cosmic speed limit, which is 186,000 miles per second. Um. No. From light's perspective, it takes zero time to get from one end of the universe to the other. Everything contracts into a singularity. Careful now. 
The next words out of your stupidity dispenser had better be something about the gamma factor having a mathematical singularity at v equals c. Where it encompasses all time and all space. What a shocker. You have no idea what a singularity is. For the record, in mathematics a singularity is a point where a function is undefined or ceases to be differentiable. This happens, for example, where it explodes to infinity or where its graph has a sharp corner. In physics, a gravitational singularity is a point with non-zero mass and zero volume. In other words, infinite density and thus infinite space-time curvature. General relativity predicts that these exist at the centers of black holes and at the Big Bang. But because they have zero volume, they are, to say the least, very tiny. The physics of the very tiny is not general relativity, but quantum mechanics. These don't play nice with each other, so right now we don't know if gravitational singularities actually exist in nature, or if quantum mechanical rules we don't yet know of put some kind of limit on how dense matter can get. But what it means for us is that a photon that came into existence from our perspective one second after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years later to today has not aged one second. Light is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This completely contradicts God having created the universe or life, because in order to do either, he would have had to change from a state of not having done so to a state of doing so, to a state of having done so. So he can't be unchanging. Also, a photon is not unchanging at all. Once it hits something, it interacts with it, and then things definitely happen to the photon. Before I conclude this video, understand this. There are only 18 fundamental particles in the entire universe. Neutrinos, electrons, quarks, Taos, muons, only 18. And of these 18, only the photon particle of light can align with all these five phenomena. Yes, the particle conveying the electromagnetic force is the one that is consistent with the properties of the electromagnetic force. Golf clap? Golf clap. Except you're wrong about those properties. Of creating the universe, creating life, omnipresent, omniscient, and not bound by time. Photons did not create the universe. They didn't even exist until after the electromagnetic force became a distinct force, which happened a tiny fraction of a second after the universe as we know it began. Photons are not omnipresent. Yes, photons are pretty much everywhere, but each photon is its own thing, and no single photon is everywhere. Photons are not omniscient. Photons are not eternal and unchanging. The only thing I can grant you in any sense is number two, because life as we know it relies on chemistry, which in turn relies on electromagnetism, and photons convey the electromagnetic force. So yes, there would be no life, at least as we know it, without photons. Partial credit for that one. As in, I'll give you a plain F. You avoided an F minus. So, in the Bible, writings from thousands of years ago describing how God works in creation and that God is light to identify the exact particle and means for God to be evident and work throughout his creation is astounding. No, what's astounding is that you would say something this stupid and then only try to support it with the fallacy of the undistributed middle over and over again. You find something that shares a particular trait with God and claim that therefore it is God. But it's never one of the defining characteristics of a God. Namely, that it's a supernatural, anthropomorphic, personal being which is in control of at least some aspect of nature. And yes, that is the only definition of God that I know of that matches the gods that are actually worshipped in real-world religions. We can add to this definition to get a specific god, but anything that doesn't even meet that definition simply isn't a god. Also, unlike gods, light exists. 
See ya.